Welcome to the Film Music Enthusiast. This episode is dedicated to the first four chords of my favorite film score on Her Majesty's Secret Service. My name's Jason Frederick. I'm a film and TV composer and a massive fan of film and television music. One of the influences that opened the door to pull me into the world of film and TV music before I had uh, decided to dedicate my uh, creative energy to it was the music to the James Bond films. I watched them weekly at the uh, end of the 1970s and I spent 25 Canadian dollars in 1982, I think, uh, on James Bond's greatest hits, The Import. Uh, which was a revelation to me, which I still own, is framed on my wall proudly uh, as a reminder of uh, why I've gotten into all of this in the first place. And this solidified uh, my love of thematic writing for motion pictures and television. The idea that you can come up with some sort of motif that underscores some aspect of this project, whether it's a character, it can be narrative, it can be the general atmosphere of the film, it can be any number of things, but it's something that is unique and supportive to that film and is as much a part of the film as the costumes are or the lighting or the action or the editing or any number of things. Uh, and this is uh, something that has never left me, my love of the power of the way this can all come together and create something that isn't a novel, that isn't a painting, that isn't uh, any number of other works of art that are all brilliant and endless in their depth of fascination in their own right, but uh, something that is unique, music and image together, is something that I've always loved. And one of the early composers who demonstrated this to me is uh, John Barry. One of the many elegant and influential contributions that uh, Mr. Barry has made to film scoring is his method of introducing material at the beginning of the film that is unique to that film. Right after you're welcomed into the experience with the James Bond theme, you then generally get to hear something that goes on to form the foundation of the score that he is writing. Uh, that was something he did very early on. You can hear it in uh, almost every film from 1964 right through to 1987. And uh, as a viewer, it's a very interesting experience and one that drew me in to uh, a love of film soundtracks and uh, composing that stayed with me to this minute. Uh, because you get some musical material to support what you're watching that you don't necessarily know the significance of until later, or uh, at least on repeat viewings. Uh, at the beginning of Thunderball, you do hear the Thunderball opening motif, but you don't know that that's what it is yet because you haven't heard the theme song yet. Uh, likewise, in You Only Live Twice, there's a lovely, uh, sinister piece of music called Space March on the soundtrack that you hear uh, at the very beginning of the film, right after the gun barrel, uh, and uh, that is followed by a short rendition of the gorgeous opening line to the You Only Live Twice theme that uh, Nancy Sinatra famously sings, uh, both of which then become a significant part of the soundtrack that follows. One of the great examples of this, in my opinion, is in the film Honor Majesty's Secret Service, and I think it's worth taking a look at the opening to see exactly how he's done this. This film was a serious departure for the series that had established itself essentially on the relationship between Sean Connery and James Bond. Uh, as a matter of fact, the film preceding this, You Only Live Twice, featured posters that said Sean Connery is James Bond on them. Now it's 1969 and Mr. Connery no longer is James Bond and a lot of other new elements are going to be uh, introduced to us, one of which of course is Mr. Lazenby. The main theme to On Her Majesty's Secret Service features four very characteristic chords in a sort of syncopated rhythm. This is something that we haven't heard before in any of the preceding films from Russia With Love, Goldfinger, Thunderball, or You Only Live Twice. And this characteristic combination of harmony and rhythm um, features throughout the score, and only this score. So the film opens with the chords we associate with the James Bond gun barrel. But then, as Mr. Lazenby shows up, we suddenly hear the Moog synthesizer. We hear something that was actually 
uh, fairly radical to put in a mainstream film at this point. Uh, most electronic music uh, that used the Moog synthesizer and other electronics was of an experimental nature, so this was a fairly bold move for Mr. Barry to make. But it did signal that something new was about to be happening. You can read more about uh, the inclusion of the Moog synthesizer and how it was incorporated in the score in John Burlingame's excellent book, The Music of James Bond. We then get an example, yet again, of what um, I think might have been Mr. Barry's marching orders uh, from the producers for the score, which was to balance the familiar with the new, to make us feel comfortable whilst we're being introduced to a brand new version of what we've come accustomed to seeing up until this point. So you get this traditional arrangement of the James Bond theme, which then leads into another one with a Moog synthesizer replacing the guitar. The twang guitar, the rock and roll instrument of the late 50s, early 60s, being replaced with the synthesizer, the instrument of the future at this point. And it works brilliantly, whether this was his stated intention or not. Um, it feels like a classic James Bond score, but it also feels fresh and new, even now, 50 years later, I think. And then about three minutes into the film, we hear these chords for the first time. These are the opening chords to the film, which we will hear famously for the next 50 years, like this. In my opinion, one of the most exciting pieces of music ever committed to film. Back at minute three of the opening of the film, we then get a variation of the chords that we've just heard for the first time. becomes the next section of this sequence. Isn't it wonderful? As Mr. Lazenby runs down the beach as James Bond to rescue Contessa Teresa di Vicenzo, this dreamy sequence where you don't quite understand what's happening. Uh, it actually helps if you read the book because there's a bit more of a backstory in the book than there is in the film. Um, is all based on these same four chords that are at the beginning of Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Uh, we've heard them as the stabs that you actually hear in the theme and now you're hearing them turned into this lovely tapestry, this blanket of dreamies. It's gorgeous and transports you somewhere, even if you haven't made the thematic connection that it's the same idea yet. One of the things I love about music is how some of it you can dive into and sort of treat it like a puzzle. There's something in it that's grabbing you and you don't quite know what it is, but it does withstand a certain amount of analysis which can go and actually explain why you like something so much. It's not a scientific process. It's not something whereby you say music is created in this way and is guaranteed to have this certain effect. But there is something mysterious going on there and it inspires you to sort of dive in and mess around with it a bit. If you play the first four chords to Honor Majesty's Secret Service, and then you just play the top notes, the intervals you get are the same intervals that make up the theme to Honor Majesty's Secret Service. It's a major second, a minor third, and a major third. And one of the defining characteristics of this piece of music that gives it its, its personality is this playing with the major third and the minor third. This is one of the elements to the music that grabbed me the first time I heard it, although it was much later that I realized that it was this that was going on. characteristic of Mr. Barry, he's created something that you don't hear in You Only Live Twice, 
or Diamonds Are Forever, or Thunderball, or many of the other themes that have followed. This playing between the major third and the minor third is something that is kind of particular to this theme. Other things are at play in other themes that make you uh, attracted to them and give them their personality, such as the fifth that you hear a lot in Diamonds Are Forever. But here, it's the interplay between this major third and minor third that give the theme its character and appear again in these opening chords. And I think this is really cool. Now we get to what is sort of the climax of this gun barrel sequence, the fight on the beach. Here, Mr. Barry introduces a new motif. And what's interesting about this is, once again, if you break it down and see the actual motif that repeats from this chord to this chord to this chord to this chord, it actually also, even though it sounds different, features the same interplay between a minor third and a major third. The second is now a minor second instead of a major second, but other than that, you've still got that major third, minor third interplay with this span of, you know, a major third at the widest, which is exactly the same as the opening melody to Honor Majesty's Secret Service, which is the same as the notes on top of the chords to the four stabs that open the uh, theme, but all three of these things sound different. If you look at the four new chords that we've introduced, um, you also hear a major third between C and E, and a minor third between G and B flat. So even though the four chords are different than the four that open the theme, and are different than the melody that we hear throughout the theme, they kind of sound like they're of a piece. And then, at the end of the fight, when Mr. Lazenby, as Bond, is mopping the beach up with these henchmen, you get two new chords. In the rhythm of the opening stabs to Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Not only has he taken the shape, he's taken the rhythm of the opening of this piece of music and used it throughout the gun barrel sequence, uh, he's also established something that we're going to be hearing throughout the movie that follows. And this is the amazing thing that Mr. Barry does film after film after film. Is this something that he's working out intellectually through the Schillinger system or some other process? Or is this just a natural, subconscious, artistic creation? Well, we'll never know. And I think the idea that it can stand up to a little analysis can help explain why it's such a strong piece of music. And a further example of uh, his brilliance in uh, showing the world a way to score a film. You've been listening to The Film Music Enthusiast with Jason Frederick. Please subscribe on iTunes and like us on Facebook to get more content just like this. And please stay tuned for the next installment of Scory Time, Reflections of a Film Music Enthusiast, an interview with the multi-talented Will Malone, composer of the classic 1973 film Deathline, starring Christopher Lee and Donald Pleasance.